Hello, everybody. Hello and welcome. Permit me to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to you, depending on your time zone. I am Pastor Maxwell Nawinghe. Yesterday, I was not able to come online. I was really, really caught up in a lot of schedules. And today again, and I thank God that before the end of today, I was able to make it as I planned. And I am so excited also to know that you are there. Thank you, those of you that have been here on Engine Speak, trying to make sure that all the information that we bring to you via this very uh, platform, you take it to the right places. God bless you. I am Pastor Maxwell Nawinghe. I'm the spiritual leader of the Gospels International, the appointed place. We are truth reigns supreme. Today, I am bringing an interesting information to you. I am bringing uh, an interview that one of the uh, major influences in the Southeast, one of the major uh, stakeholders in the Southeast, Chief, uh, Chief Dan Olasi, one of the interview that he granted on the AIT, the African Independent Television, some time ago. And when I listened to that very interview, it speaks volume of what is happening today. As at the time that he granted that interview, what is happening now in the Southeast, the insecurity and the law of criminal elements that has, have been using the name of Namdekan to perpetrate a lot of crimes, heinous crimes, all in the name that he is detained or he gave the instructions or he gave the order, you know, different kind of information, different kind of report coming from the activities of some criminal elements, all in the guise of Namdekan is detained. Namda Kano said, Namda Kano sent us. There has been chaos in the Southeast. And it has been a, a major, a major suggestion and plea and demand, both to the government or from the government of the day to release in Namda Kano so that some of these criminal elements can actually be fished out. Because when Namda Kano is released, he would defend himself. He would speak for himself. And anyone that had been using his name to commit different kind of crimes, they can't be bold anymore to come out to say he sent them or they are acting on his instructions. So this is one of the major critical ways to bring about a lasting peace in the southeastern region of Nigeria. So uh, the chief himself spoke extensively in that light. And that is the... Uh, the major clip I will bring in to us today. And if time permits, after that very clip, I am going to come back to you. And if we are not able to make it, expect us tomorrow. God bless you immensely. Stay here and uh, see the interview. Hear what he has to say. And of course, you can pick one or two things out of what he's saying. You can, you know, make your own comparisons can make your own comparisons to to see or to know whether what he's saying is in line or not but for me what he is saying is 100 percent truth there is no lie or propaganda attached to it i am bringing it to screen immediately i am bringing it to the screen don't see it as a clip oh it is a clip who know it is not doctored anything it was a live interview that he granted on this very famous television network or media house. African Independent Television is one of the mainstream frontline medias in Nigeria. So here is the interview. Here is the interview. Today and our talking point will be on the Southeast uh, political situation and a security situation as well, as well as the economic situation because everything that's happening is actually affecting every sphere of that Southeast region. We do have one of the prominent Southeast political leaders, Chief Dan Ulasi, who on Monday again visited the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra. I thought he has done that before, so he will be leading us into what transpired this time. Salt of the initial visit. Thank you so much, Chief. 
here with us uh, to tell us all of this. Thank you very much, Chief, and welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. All right. You've been there before. That is Chief Dan Olasi. Now, listen. Results of the initial visit. Thank you so much, Chief Dan Olasi, is here with us uh, to tell us all of this. Thank you very much, Chief, and welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. All right. You've been there before. You went again. Some people would say after your first visit, you know, uh, by now, maybe things would have gone down maybe security wise in the southeast, and then probably the ruins of Namika would have happened from all your engagements. What's going on? Well, I I have to explain first that I didn't plan to come for this visit. So then on Saturday, I had an emergency meeting uh, message that he wanted to see me. So I had to rearrange all the protocols I had for the weekend and then was lucky to have a flight on Sunday. So yesterday I went, uh, but rather right unfortunately, I was there with his uh, father-in-law and one of the attorneys. For one reason or the other, I didn't see him. And we waited till about 4 o'clock. Uh, the father-in-law saw him. He found him asking, where is his uh, uncle? He wants to see me, he wants to see him. But later, yes, it is. I didn't see him, but uh, at least the messages he wanted to discuss with me were sent across to his uh, father-in-law. So, but uh, I decided that I'll come back next week. I'm taking him to Supreme Court. It hasn't actually tried to come to Supreme Court that he can see me. So what would you think? Uh, you, you, you were not allowed to see That's him? That is what I don't Because I know you could be there before, and you saw him in my discussion. Yes. With him, and I praised the, 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 the DSS for a good job. Yes, so they they received me well, you know. I didn't know what happened, because we were three on the list. And by the judgment of uh, Mrs. Yanko, of which of the courts, Three people are supposed to see him and that they must see him. So, and nobody told me any reason why I could not see him yesterday, you know. And he kept telling them from inside that his uncle was waiting and he wanted to see yeah. him, but I couldn't see him. But be that as it may, you know, the, the father ended up passed on the message because he wanted to discuss where we stopped the last time, how far the messages he had me to pass on to our people, you know, especially the sit at home on Monday. What is going on? The level of violence. What do we do? And it is thankful that the boy who is in that languishing in such a, an environment is thinking about the well-being of his people. I became very emotional about it. You know, I don't think I people understand what that young man is passing through. Very brilliant. And when I use the word brilliant, I use it in all his, you know, forms. Very brilliant, well-spoken young man. And what is his crime? What is crime that he's asking of justice? fairness, equity for his people. And like I normally say, there will be no peace without justice anywhere in the world. You know, you need to have a recognition. And you can see all the things being written in the papers. Is not the kind of responsible for what is happening in bandits? Is he responsible for Boko Haram? Is he responsible for s You know, the whole country is blocked down now. And like I was discussing with my former PRP members, you know, uh, just about... Uh, Two years ago, before he died, Dr. Jinaidu Mohammed, who all did PRP. You know, we laid a man, I mean, kind of at Airports in 1979 after he came for Southeast Park. Mm-hmm. And I asked him a particular question. I know, I mean, kind of turn and said, Dan, that was the day he made me his special advisor for the whole East. He said, Dan, people are not capable of a revolution because those who build don't destroy. Your people have done so much in this country that they can. But any day we see crisis, Bloodletting, violence in the north. Let us know that that's the beginning of the end of Nigeria and that we should watch it. Dr. Junaid Mohammed reminded me this a few months before he died. He said, This is what is happening in the north, and everybody appears to be nonchalant about it. People are not being killed. And you remember in this program about two years ago, I said we are pushing the level of Afghanistan. So every news now is 200 killed, 100 killed to kidnap. This is not only in Nigeria. And tell me how. A president will go from India to Dubai to New York, asking people to come and invest, invest where. Well. You would have expected that this president would have sat down. Look at the Nigerian problem. What is the iPod problem? What is it that they are demanding? There's nothing dialogue cannot stop out. And Buhari dumped this boy for the past how many years and so that is the legacy of Buhari. No discussion, military days. They are killing everybody everywhere in this country now. Is that the peace? Is that the environment where investors will bring in their money? So I find it difficult really to know where we're going because I don't know where we're coming from as I just point in time. All right, 
much I've done. Um, I know that a few months ago, I think between the end of July and first of August, you saw Cardinal Decano, yes. and you know from your conversations with us within that period, it lasted over an hour, and you discussed very important things that had to do with the Saudi security. And you also said that later on details would be given. Now you've come, and even though you didn't see him in person, you still had the messages passed on to you. Yes. Now, in terms of solutions moving forward, I hear you talk about you know the need to get him out, the need to actually find you know some sort of lasting solution that will further on peace and mediation. However, in this administration, from the body language of His Excellency Bola Mentinibo, has there been any further engagement going forward since that trip to be able to engage and for them to understand what needs needs to be done in order for him to be released to increase the safety of the lives of people in the Southeast? The problem at the moment is I don't know who's in charge. Absolutely, I don't know who's in charge in this government. Because the president is not in the country. So you don't really know, is it Pajate Abela that is in control or somebody else? Because if the guy was somewhere sitting down to understand it, even though it's his party that ran the affairs of this country for eight years, but he wasn't part of that government in the true sense of being part of the government. He was the leader of the party, but he wasn't in the executive, so to speak. He would have sat down, like I said earlier, to know what are really the problems of this country. And the problem in this country today is insecurity, insecurity, insecurity. Have you determined how you want to follow it? This is why I'm making an effort. You know, there are things I discuss with Ghana I cannot make public because I've been running around the whole of the Southeast. Every Monday I'm in one state or the other to know how far, you know, the implementation of, uh, you know, to stop uh, stay at home. And it's catching up. A lot of banks in Enu, for instance, banks have opened up. A lot of shops open up. You know, we use a lot of methods to get to people. But he's worried that his agitation for fairness for his people does not involve our people killing ourselves. And I think that's the most worrisome part of what he's passing through. Because okay, so but, but if, if you look at the, the emboldening atmosphere, especially maybe those in the, in the South East from the state region, yesterday was Monday, and the seat at home did still thrive because a lot of people who were supposed to return from a trip from here in Abuja said they were not going to risk it because already over the social media you were seeing videos of some people who were you know accosted you know in transit when they were trying to move around the city in terms of the fact that you have said that you know these people will not kill their own willingly but there has been investigation that even those from the south is Igbos themselves are part of the cabal part of the cell of those who are killing within those regions so what sort of messaging can Kano also bring to fore to encourage some of those young men to shape their swords? Look, I, there's only one solution now. I'm trying as much as possible to reach my former friend, the governor of Imo State. And I pray God and the next one, two weeks, I'll be able to reach him. I'll try and reach the Minister of uh, Defense, uh, David Omahe. These are two prominent Igbo sons who are one is a governor. Uh, he is the chairman of Southeast Governors Forum. He is chairman of Progressive Governors. So he's in a very top level to have access to governance. Um, David Omahe, to all intents and purposes, was one of the best performing governors in this country. If you go David to David Omahe, the Minister of Works? Yes. Why don't you get into what I'm saying? What I'm saying is that we need their influence to put our people together, all our governors, with our legislators, especially at the federal level, to approach the the president of this country and ask. We are not begging. The Court of Appeal has discharged this boy from all the charges leveled against him to ask for his discharge. I mean, for his release. If Namdi Khan is released today, there will be 90% peace in the Southeast. A lot of people are carrying out criminal activities on the basis of the fact that he's being detained unjustly. If you hear that he's released today, that part of the country would have had some level of peace. And then we can attach our attention to Boko Haram and bandits and Esmen and what, uh, what have you. So, but if you don't have a government that is sitting down to have a proper analysis of what the problems are, 
then it is difficult to know what to do. But I'm interested in what happens in the Southeast now. I must reach the Imo governor, reach the Omahi, to organize the other governors with our legislators, especially our senators, to approach the president, to get this young man released. That he said he wants justice and fairness for his people. Is it a crime? You may not like his methodology, but what he's asking is not a crime. Hmm. Okay, I think if you go there, there are hundreds of people in detention in DSF, and more than half of them are Igbos. I got this information yesterday. A lot of people are languishing, dying in that place. What kind of democracy are we running? That people between Benue and, and Plateau states, and they were not declared uh, terrorists. Hmm. All right, Chief. Uh, the government of the day at the time Namdi was taken in uh, uh, said they were they were not happy with his methodology. In fact, they believed he was inciting some young people, you know, in the southeast to take up arms, maybe against uh, state, uh, you know, agencies and all that, or institutions of government. Uh, whether that is the true position of things uh, still remains to be seen. But in your engagement, because um, if you're saying that if they release Namde Kanu, then the killings in the southeast will cease, then it will it will also mean saying that the killings are being carried out by IPOP members, which they have vehemently denied in certain cases. So is it that other people you know, other elements of criminality are now using the fact that Nam Dekado is being held and are carrying out this problem, or is it a politically motivated killing? So what exactly do you think well, is that's happening? what I just said here about three or four minutes ago, that people are using the fact that he's being detained. Criminals use it as a platform now to carry out atrocities, you know, because those who believe in, you know, frivolities, if you believe in, a, you know, some form of storytelling, you know, this is happening there. Igbos are, this is happening to Igbos. For instance, look at the government of Buhari. Look at the appointments he made. And it's happening in this same government. 90% of everything that concerns finance in this country goes to Southwest. People are complaining everywhere, not just now in the East, the whole of the North. The Fulani areas are complaining. That you don't make government to be a private business. You don't know what problems that we develop even further as we're discussing what is going on. People deliberately create more problems. How can one zone have Minister of Finance, uh, Internal Revenue, uh, Central Bank Governor, uh, uh, Post Authority, every component in where the major resources of the country comes out from, one section of the country takes it over. And you think others will go to sleep? There's a limit to which the sleeping dog will lie. So these are problems we inflict on ourselves instead of being fair and just to every section of this country so that there will be peace. They don't want to do it. Why? So what I'm saying is that the, the, the problem in the Southeast did not exacerbate before now because now criminals have taken over. Kidnapping is good business. They catch you one or two, three millions will part from your family post. So if they are lucky, they escape, they eat the money. And it's going around the whole country. Yeah. I mean, in the whole uh, the, the Southeast zone. So why, that's why I mentioned that I'll try to reach my friend because Imo appears to be the most affected. Yes, because I, I was going to come there yes. on, on September 19th at exactly 10 a.m. Some security operatives were ambushed and burned in their yes. vehicle. And, you know, the lives of our security men, police and all of that were lost in that inferno. A lot of indigenes, I mean, it happened in Himembano in Imo State. Mm. However, both in Imo in Abia, because Abia is just nexus to you know, yes. they share the same transit border, have said that isn't it time that there is a state of emergency called in the southeast as regards the insecurity? Because already billions of dollars have been lost in the economic circle of the southeast. So what then is left is for the governors, like you said, you will speak to the Imo state governor. But before then, isn't it time for a state of emergency to be declared on the state of insecurity in the southeast? I don't understand what it's declar declaration of a state of emergency will do. Already the southeast is occupied, many surely. And that is what the state of emergency will do. Nearly 10% of the Nigerian armed forces and policemen are in the southeast. Every inch of the ground is occupied. But still, the, the, the violence is going on, which shows you 
that somebody somewhere can help stop that violence. I have gone around the whole of the Southeast to know that even though people don't say it, the love and trust they have on and the can you can't begin to imagine it. They believe that he represents the summary of all the ills the Igbos have suffered in this country. That's their belief. Whether rightly or wrongly, they believe that. Most of us believe that, including myself. He is the only voice that we hear now with everything happening around our place. And if we have good leadership that is honest to itself, our people should be able, and especially when the Court of Appeal has discharged this bill, that all the charges you people have, have no basis. So it is even easier for a government that is interested in security to release him, make it as a test case. Releasing them, they can be based on the legal framework and see what will happen in one, two, three months. If it doesn't work, then we start talking about this kind of emergency we're suggesting. We have a promise that if that young man comes out, you won't believe the different meetings people are holding, unauthorized meetings, the whole of South East. Nobody tells them anything. They don't know they said this. Now they say we do this. This person said we do this. On top of what we have the problem with the guy in Finland, complicating the fact that he's doing what he's saying, better than the fact that Nnamdi can is being heard. So you see that most of the atrocities being carried out are based on the fact that this young man is being detained. So why don't government, you know, try one step, use this avenue, get him out, you have a legal basis of getting him out, watch him, and see whether it improves security in, in, the, in the Southeast. If it does improve security in the Southeast, why can't we as Christians and good Muslims dialogue? And I said the president has a supreme opportunity. He's a devout Muslim. And his wife is a devout Christian. And I believe they read the two holy books. Nothing can happen without peace, forgiveness. If we can talk and get problems on the way in the Southeast, we can see that Boko Haram, they are not, uh, they didn't fall from heaven. They are human beings. Hopefully, most of them are Nigerians. I believe in dialogue. No matter how bad the situation is, I believe in dialogue. Even with the bandits, even if it's economic, it could be discussed. Because when you continue collecting property, I mean, uh, resources from somebody's land, and he's hungry, can't train his children, the next thing is violence. So government should be able to sit down. How do we accommodate these people? How do we make them feel part of the resources God has given them in their land? Just like when uh, Ken Saru and his people were protesting in the, in the South South, and they killed him. Somehow, it does appear at, at, officially that things are quieting down. But that is not peace. Peace is the one that has honesty and justice attached to it. Oh. And I would pray this president to sit down and look at how do we engage. Because the, the country is at the precipice. People, oh. Do you know a time in this country people travel at night? You don't travel in the day. People about 25 years ago, you can move from Enugu to Sokoto or to any part of this country. And nobody will stop you on the highway. Try it now, you end up in a mug somewhere. You can't try it. And every day we see the security situation in the country, you know, going down, down, and it does appear nobody's interested. Uh, it's even quite uh, disheartening the fact that even uh, security office officers who are supposed to be providing that security are also being, uh, you know, taken out, uh, which is quite sad. This is why it is, excuse me, it is painful to me as, a, as a, an officer of the Biafran Army. When I see Nigerian soldiers in uniform, you don't know how much appreciation I have for them because I know what it means that their life is on the line. They are being killed, like we said, and nobody supports that kind of thing. Who kills them? Is it poss impossible to find out who is doing this? How are they doing it? Are they living? Just like the governor was saying when he visited the place, something happened. Are these people not part of the community? Is there a conspiracy from outside Ibo land to make sure we don't move forward, that our people should be killed, so that people are encouraged to go and kill security forces? Does the security man you kill, does it, would it make it easier to release him and become? You see, there are localized problems being engineered by factors you cannot explain immediately. This is why I would expect that if our five governors can sit down and tell themselves the truth and organize some serious minded uh, legislators at the federal level, especially with the deputy speaker of the federal house, we help people. They can sit down this president and talk to him. Yeah. This it be the beginning of something. Release this young man. There's nothing that the kind of has done that is unknown to law. All right, Jeff Lassie, I'll just step in here a bit for us to crave your indulgence. We'll take a quick break and bring you Kakaki Socials. Rena will be up next with that. 
All right, before we went on that short break, you were talking about how we can resolve these issues. And now, uh, many have thought that the Southeast governors, for instance, or the political bigwigs in the Southeast have enough, you know, to ensure that what is going on in the Southeast stops. For instance, we do have Southeast governors, and this uh, seat at home has gone on for a while, even though Namdekan has consistently said it's not the one issue issue in the seat at home. And you, if, if some people will even tell you that even government, uh, you know, um, officers stay at home as well. On Monday, schools are shut, and you can imagine what that has done to the economic situation in the country. Now that there's a new president, uh, beyond you going to visit a more governor like you talked about and seeing as uh, Dave Umahe, the Minister of Works now, what do you think, what do you suggest people from that southwest, uh, southeast region should be doing now to ensure that insecurity becomes a thing of the past and, and, and of course, meets the president to release, uh, you know, an you know, I think on Sunday, the... Hannes, or whatever is left of it, led by Iwanyan, who they had an Igbo there. So I heard, you know, it was a Sunday I, started, I came to Abuja, and I heard he spoke extensively on uh, the insecurity, you know, talked also about the release of Nambekan, but this is not the time of spoken words now. It has to be action, and that is why I said, having discussed with Nambekan and knowing where he's coming from, and looking at the peculiarities of our zone, I don't think anything else can bring peace in that zone if that boy is not released. Yes. If that boy is not released, nothing will bring peace. It will get worse and worse. I don't think anything else can bring peace in that zone if that boy is not released. Mm -hmm. Just with Sinan the and knowing where he's coming from and looking at the peculiarities of our zone, I don't think anything else can bring peace in that zone if that boy is not released. If that boy is not released, nothing will bring peace. It will get worse and worse. And that is why the the Imo governor I used to know, I used to be quite close friends. He's a very patriotic Nigerian of Igbo descent. Okay. And I don't know what's his problem. I haven't I've met him once at a funeral since he became governor and we we'll never met again. Oh. Uh, David Omahi was quite close, very active, very you know, he gave honor to gov uh, gov good governance. So it's somebody we all admire. Both of them can organize the other governors to lead a delegation to get this boy out. Because I give a warning. If anything happens to that boy in detention, yeah. present and next generation of Igbos will not have mercy on all of us collectively. All right. Um, because there will be serious problem. All right. Serious problem. All right. Um, I, I hear your warning loud and clear. I'm sure the presidency also hears it. But just before you go, or we let you go, uh, the presidential election petition, of course, uh, Supreme Court, what do you expect? What are you You know, I went to with my principal the day we did what they call the final presentation. I was with that ticket. You know, and I listened. That was the day I knew we were allowed to take that governor. I listened to the chairman of that panel, lambasting. It will be lambasting, and people lambasting. The two political parties are putting a petition. Even a senior advocate, Duce, who was making his presentation, he disgraced him. He told you where he was going. But most importantly, I sat in my room for almost 12 hours. Or a this time. broadcast is going to end that, uh, in less than three minutes. This very broadcast is going to end in less than two minutes. There can never be peace in the absence of justice. This is what I want you to know today. It is not possible to have peace in the atmosphere of injustice. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. These are the facts of life. United Nations judgment has declared that Namda Kano is not a terrorist and that IPOB was registered duly by him in 2012. And the ultimatum that was given to the Nigerian government had elapsed since 2022, six months ultimatum to release him and pay him adequate compensation. If Nigerians, by now it is clear to everyone's understanding that the government is not for you, what you should be asking for now is your self-determination.
the more you go to the post for election, the more you renew the wickedness, the more you renew the subjugation. Goodbye from here. See you tomorrow. God bless you.